Thank you again for coming to the Alberta Transplant Institute lecture series. We have some very special international guests today talking to us about tolerance induction, which Dr. Solis is going to introduce in just a minute. And with that, I'll hand over. Okay. To okay. Well, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Kim Solis in laboratory medicine, and uh, today is a very exciting, long and anticipated day. Uh, my two close uh, collaborators from Johns Hopkins in Baltimore are here. And one of them I've been working with for a very long time, uh, Jim Burdick and I, uh, there was a protocol biopsy study that began in January 1983, without which the Banff classification never would have ha happened. So in those um, eight years between 83 and 91, we, we accumulated a lot of biopsy experience um, that, that allowed us then to create the BAMF classification in 91. So as part of this visit of Dr. Sun and Burdick, there is this talk today, which is entirely science, almost no history and, and uh, lots of, of very exciting futuristic science in the uh, regenerative medicine realm. And then uh, tomorrow we're going to mix things up a bit and um, all three of us will talk tomorrow, um, including Dr. Burdick. <clears throat> You may regard me as a big picture thinker, but I think Dr. Burdick intends to out big picture me. So I'll, I'll give a medium sized picture first, and then he'll give the big picture, and then <laughs> Dr. Sun will uh, continue after that tomorrow. You may expect me to give a long introduction for Dr. Sun. But you may not realize that Dr. Sun is my superior, and it is very disadvantageous, not a good idea in, in life at all, to give a lengthy introduction for your boss, because you'll get something wrong and that will have consequences. Now you're thinking, how could he possibly be my boss? Because Dr. Mengel sitting right there is my boss. But about a year ago, I got this contract for a 0.8 professor, and all of you who have been addressing me, none of you have yet addressed me as a 0.8 professor. So Dr. Mengel is in charge as my boss for the 0.8, but then there's this 0.2 of freedom, you know, and Dr. Sun is, is my boss for the, for the 0.2. So I think I need to be very careful what I say, say about him. So. Uh, I'm not going to say anything very lengthy, but I thought there's one other thing I should mention. Most of you would know this probably, but a week ago something remarkable happened. The Faculty of Medicine created a video and released it on the history of the GI division. And you might say, what, but why should we care? Well, the GI division is important at this institution. The D dean is from the GI division, and all of us, if you think about it, intersect with people from the GI division. And the most moving part of that video is when Ron Wenzel cries, describing a scenario where one chair of pathology is deathly ill in a, in a very fancy room and nobody knows what's wrong with him. And another chair figures out this is the first Canadian instance of Legionnaire's disease. And just about a year after Legionnaire's had first been described, and Ron Wenzel, who was one of these tough as nails, medical administrator, VP, um, I never imagined that there was, oh, you all should watch this video. I, I think it, it, it's completely unlike any video I will ever uh, create, but it's a part of our history here. It's part of the history of laboratory medicine, and, and, and it's very, very moving. Uh, it's called On the Shoulder of Giants, and you all know GI people, talk to any of them and they'll give you the length 
for that video. Okay, back to Dr. Sun. So, um, but first, yeah. <laughs> so these two visitors have been subjected to poetry at the moment that they got here. And I think that's kind of a stressful beginning, right? I mean, you, you never had another visit where, where and Ron Wenzel's tears, uh, I have a 16 line poem about tears that I'll just read to you now. We're not gonna be struck by lightning, you know, the building's not gonna collapse if we do a short poem. Really good tears, strength and resolve, quieting fears, leadership qualities not in arrears, insight, vision, as the smoke clears, but who knew the value of really good tears? To see unaware of the actions of the eyes allow other shortcuts to be realized. Lubricating vision furthers the mission. Lessons, revisions, helps all decisions. Without tears seems stuffy and aloof. Tears bring us closer to the real truth. The emotions side open door wide. In seeing clearly nothing compares. Who knew the value of really good tears? So, um, Dr. Sun is going to tell us about tolerance from induction of allograft chimerism. And he is Associate Professor of Surgery, Director of Transplant Biology Research Center, and my boss for the point two professor. <laughs> okay, take, take it away, Zala. Thank you so much, for, uh, Dr. Solitz, for your very nice and kind introduction. Um, I cannot be your boss, to be honest. <laughs> sure um, you can. <laughs> and also, again, I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Solitz and the team of Transplantation Institute and here for inviting us to be here. And it's truly my great honor to be here to share with you our recent works um, about transplantation tolerance studies. Um, so today um, I'm talking about the topic of transplantation tolerance. Um, probably you would think that tolerance, transplantation tolerance now uh, is old topic. It's probably nothing new and uh, probably not, seems not exciting at all, uh, but I hope uh, in next 45 minutes, you will learn something new and you will know something you have never heard before. Okay, here's my disclosure. And as a transplantation body lab, um, most of our studies actually um, in animal models. The animal models we are currently studying including mouse, rat, pig, and monkeys. And I should acknowledge that these animals are truly heroes in our discovery. As all we know that transplantation, organ transplantation is a life-saving intervention for many patients with end-stage of liver, kidney, heart, and lung diseases. The discovery of pretend immunosuppression led to a reduced episode rejection and improved short-term outcomes. For example, 90% all transplant recipients survive in the first year. However, the long-term outcomes have remained suboptimal. For example, only 44% kidney grafts are functioning at 10 years. In addition, the need for taking a lifelong immunosuppression has significant toxicities. Arversely, the tolerance the success of transplant uh, um, an organ without peril uh, lifelong immunosuppression has been the central goal of transplantation research in the last six decades. In the early 1950s, Madawa and his colleagues first reported the induction of transplant tolerance uh, by injection of donor hematopoietic cells intravenously into neonatal mice uh, within 24 hours of the birth. The evidence tolerance can be occurred in humans was illustrated by the fact that recipients mm -hmm. of successful bone marrow transplantation with end-stage renal failure had 
undergone kidney transplantation from the same donor without the need for immunotherapy. This case suggests that um, if recipients takes on some donor's properties, such as donor mesenchyme or uh, donor hematopoietic stem cells, may induce mixed chemism and may result in tolerance. So in the last three decades, tolerance, induction tolerance through mixed chemism has been extensively studied. And these, so these um, three centers, including Stanford Group, uh, MGH and the Northwestern Group, they are three leading centers in studying uh, tolerance induction through mixed cameras. As you can tell from their protocols, the recipients received very toxic preparations during the procedures, even though only 50%, about 50% patients withdrawn from immunosuppressive medications. The tolerance protocol themselves are associated with uh, morbidity, morbidity and the risk of infections um, and the risk of lost grafts. Because the limited access for these protocols has raised the question, tolerance, is it worth it? The goal of tolerance for patients is to produce a reliable, non-toxic method for immunosuppression free transplant success. So obviously, we are not there yet. So why aren't we there? Let's go back to the basic knowledge for transplantation. So current knowledge suggests transplants may success all three different ways. First, imagine that there's no interaction between the recipient and the donor graft due to effectively supplied uh, immunosuppressive drugs. Second, paradigm of recipient and donor graft interaction is that in which recipient takes on some of donor's properties such as hematopoietic stem cells to induce mixed chemism. And that leads to some of patients withdrawn from immunosuppression. But a third potential interactions between donor and recipient is that recipient repopulate of donor graft. If that happens, then the, recipient, the donor will become recipient themselves, no need for immunosuppression. So based on these strategies, based on these, uh, you know, uh, the potential strategies, probably we can think about how we can induce tolerance or how we can make the transplant recipient survive for long term. The first strategy, obviously, is conventional immunosuppression. Uh, which significantly improve the short-term outcomes, but not long-term outcomes. And the second strategy is to induce chemism. As we already mentioned, that many patients actually um, cannot get tolerance at all, and some patients may die. So each strategy had advantage and disadvantage. However, a third potential strategy, graft repopulation by receiving the stem cells, would have a reverse advantage over the conventional post-transplant strategies because the graft can become self and no need for a lifelong immunosuppression. But the question is, is that possible? So in the last uh, two decades, numerous studies um, have demonstrated that bone marrow stem cells can differentiate into many, liver many tissues in different organs for example, hematopoietic stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells, and uh, IP, uh, endocytic progenitor cells, and also newly identified mu cells, multi-lineage differentiating stress-inducing cells. So these cells play an important role in organ regeneration and repair after injury. And more recently, two studies also confirmed that Regulatory T cells also play a role in the um, tissue regeneration and repair. And interestingly, these cells actually can traffic under certain conditions. Uh, the traffic of these cells actually regulated by a chemical called uh, stromal cell derived one factor one SDF one, uh, because SDF one can bind to uh, 
uh, G protein coupled chemical receptor for CXR4, and that play an uh, important and unique role in regulation of stem cell trafficking. So basically, stem cells from bone marrow can migrate to the one, whatever areas with high expression of SDF1. And recently, uh, clinical, clinical studies in human patients with a cardiac attack show that patients who had a higher number of endothelial progenitor cells, actually they have better long-term outcome after cardiac infarction. Now, think, let's back to the transplantation setting. So after transplantation, if we are able to mobilize these vomer stem cells, and somehow these mobilized stem cells can be recruited into allograft, especially into a rejecting allograft, imagine that stem cell may regenerate the tissues and repopulate allograft. So allograft may eventually become a chimeric allograft, a mixture of donor cells and resistant cells. So indeed, there was a speculation at the time of Madawa uh, that host may play an important role in transplant tolerance by converting the graft to a host genotype. So in the words of Madawa, he said, foreign kidneys do sometimes become acceptable to their host for a reason other than acquired tolerance. The possible explanation is that the progressive, perhaps very extensive, replacement of the vascular endothelium of the graft by endothelium of the host region, a process might occur insidiously and imperceptibly weakened, that, that weakened maybe by, um, by a immunosuppressed treatment. So a few years later, in 1971, um, Dr. Mel Williams at the Johns Hopkins um, has confirmed that hypothesis in a RAND model of aortic allograms. And because it was thought that rejection of all the endothelium would lead to thrombosis or thrombotic failure of allograms, the notion of host repopulation in this way was abundant. But interestingly, 30 years later, in 2001, from the same group, Dr. Mel Williams' group, um, have studied uh, human biopsy samples in a female liver transplant into a male recipient. Uh, they confirmed the host repopulation of liver graft endothelium. So indeed, careful uh, examination of uh, biopsy samples from human transplants uh, have revealed a small number of host repopulation in the graft. And interestingly, the host repopulation correlated with um, episode of rejection, uh, flood, uh, graft volume, um, and inflammatory response. Here is our hypothesis. If if the limited rep host repopulation that is currently observed could be facilitated, it's possible that conversion to a predominantly host phenotype would permit long-term growth function without immunosuppression. So about 10 years ago, we have studied an interesting uh, red liver transplantation model. So in this model, Despite MHC disparities, the liver transplant from Lewis liver rat to into a DA rat uh, undergoes uh, we call moderate rejection at the early time after transplantation, but survive indefinitely without any immunosuppressive treatment. So in this model, we found accumulation of host derived stem cells in liver allografts at the early time after transplantation. Um, for example, the uh, C, C, uh, CK, is, which is a bone marrow stem cell marker, OV6 is a hepatic progenitor cell uh, called oval cell marker. And as you can see, 
uh, RT1A staining with the host MHG class 1 antigen. So, as you can see, there are um, host derived uh, uh, secret of over six party cells appeared in liver tissue sections at three days after transplantation. And the positive cell, the number of positive cells increased significantly at 10 days after transplantation. By using uh, immunohistochemical staining for host M MHC class 1 antigen, we call RT1A, uh, you can see many host positive cells appeared in liver tissue sections at one month after whole liver transplantation. Interestingly, compared to whole liver transplantation, small size liver transplantation accelerate the ingress of host cells. For example, you can see some host derived cells appeared in liver tissue sections as early as three hours after transplantation. And the number of host cells increased in a time-dependent function. By 10 days, you can see patches of host positive cells appear in liver tissue sections after transplantation. Um, we reacted the tissue sections from small liver graft at 10 days after transplantation with anti size 3 labeled anti albumin antibodies and phase labeled anti host MHC class 1 antibodies. So, as you can see clearly, the host derived cells contained albumin, indicating these cells probably are functioning hepatocytes. The host three population was further confirmed by using a green fluorescence protein transgenic, we call GFP transgenic Lewis rats. We use GLP transgenic Lewis rats as a, a liver donor. So here you can see the GLP positive, small, reduced size, small livers. If you transplant into a, the syngenic liver here, syngenic recipient, white top syngenic recipients, by 10 days, you can see the liver graft fully regenerated, the same size as the whole livers. Uh, but the GLP fluorescence expression remains the same as the donor. However, if you transform the same you know, GLP positive small livers into a wild type DA, allogenic DA recipients, by 10 days, again, you see the liver allograft fully regenerate to the normal liver size. But the GLP expression was dramatically decreased. That suggests part of liver allograft probably already repopulated by host-derived GFP negative cells. And interestingly, if you give the same animals allogenic recipients with cyclosporin treatments, as you can tell here, the cyclosporin immunosuppressive treatment not only inhibit liver regeneration, but also prevent the host Repopulation. So finally, we use a uh, uh, in situ high hybridization method for Y chrom chromosome in a sex mismatch the uh, transplantation models uh, confirm again confirm that host derived cells appear in liver allograts at the ten days after transplantation, and the host Y chromosome positive hypothesize dramatically increase at one month after transplantation. Uh, we use uh, 12 chromosome as uh, internal controls to, to avoid you missed any nucleus because the cutting sections. So what we have learned from this animal model? Okay, we found that actual hepatic stem cells can differentiate, differentiate it into uh, liver tissues first. And second, liver allograft can be repopulated by recipients. And the regenerative stimuli due to a small size allograft actually can accelerate stem cell recruitment. But 
both regeneration and recruitment are impacted by immunosuppressive treatment. These findings support this hypothesis. Liver allograft injury due to ischemic reperfusion, small size, reduced size, or rejection drives liver regeneration. Normally, intrahepatic stem cells or hepatocytes themselves can regenerate the liver after injury. However, these donor cells are under attack by host immune system. Therefore, probably hepatic host derived stem cells can regenerate the liver after injury. However, after transplantation, usually for our patients, we give full dose immunosuppressions to prevent rejections. So in that case, the immunosuppression prevent the immune-mediated immune injury and protect the host cells. Therefore, no need for actual hepatic host-derived cells to regenerate the liver. So that may be reason why we only identified a small numbers of host repopulation in humans. Based on these findings, we developed three strategies to promote host repopulations. First, we, our original idea was to uh, give a low dose immunosuppression to convert a severe rejection into a moderate re rejection. And second, we try to give a small graft, reduce the size graft and transplantation. And third, we think if we can use drugs to mobilize stem cells from the host, that may promote host repopulation. And fortunately, in 2008, during that time, we found a one drug just approved by, um, by um, uh, FDA for the use in cancer patients for uh, collecting hematopoietic stem cells before chemotherapy and radiation. Uh, after that, after chemotherapy radiation, uh, collecting, collected stem cells will be transplanted back to the patients. And that drug can mobilize stem cells called AMD-7100 or um, uh, polar example. So anyway, we think the balance between uh, rejection and regeneration may result in a uh, host repopulation. So here is the drug AMD-3100, uh, which is an uh, antagonist of chemokine receptor 4, CXL4, and AMD treatment blocks the in, uh, interaction between SDF1 and uh, CXL4 allowing releasing of uh, bomber stem cells into the circulation, into the blood. So we test these strategies in a strong rejecting red string combinations. Um, so, I, uh, um, so basically we transplant a, a DA liver into a Lewis recipient. In this model, without any treatments, all animal died within a couple of weeks after transplantation. And we test many uh, different kind of protocols, and finally, we thought this protocol works better. So basically, as you can see, we give a, a dual drug um, immediately after transplantation, and day one, day two, day three, and then day seven. So only first week after transplantation, we give such treatment. And I have, I have to mention that the tacrolimers which is FK56, which we gave the dosage, 0 0.1 milligram per kg, which is about one-tenth of effective dosage to prevent acute rejection. So here is the result. As you can see, the animals with either um, sitting control or single drug treatment most animals died within two weeks after transplantation, except one animal treated with low dose FK survived 120 days, but eventually died. And we found that animal developed fibrosis, actually. But uh, 12 out of 13 treated animals survived for long term with normal liver functions. So interestingly, we found 
In this model, Tucker lemurs reacted synergistically with MD3100 in not only mobilization of bomber stem cells, but recruitment of these mobilized stem cells into the liver allogram. For example, you can see the, there, the MD alone can mobilize stem cells into the circulation in the blood, but not much cells went to the liver allogram. However, if you give combination treatment, so you can see there are synergy in mobilization stem cells and also a synergy in recruitment of these stem cells into the liver allograms. And this actually the same thing we found uh, uh, these combination drugs had a synergy in mobilized uh, regulatory T cells. And interestingly, we found the regulatory T cells not only CD4 positive, but also many CD8 positive regulatory T cells. And we, um, this work has been done in 2010, 2011. During that time, only eight papers published about CD8 positive regulatory T cells, and most of them in the autoimmune disease field. Um, so we don't understand what's the function of this CD8 positive regulatory T cell during that time, but we found a dramatic increase in the uh, liver allograms. So finally, we determine whether there's a host repopulation. As you can see, we transplant a white type liver, which is a GLP negative, into a GLP positive recipients. By three months, you can see dramatically increased GLP expressions in the liver allograms. And the repopulation of host cells has been further confirmed by uh, tissue sections under fluorescence microscope. And you can see here, there are many GLP positive cells surrounded around a central vein areas. People would ask, okay, liver is a unique organ and easy to regenerate, probably can fully regenerate after uh, injury. So this treatment maybe only works in liver transplantation model. So then we try to extend our findings to a kidney, more rigorous rejection model of kidney transplantation to see if it also works in kidney transplantation. We kind of modified some protocols from, uh, from the uh, uh, rat liver transplantations, but basically we gave a very short treatment first week after transplantation, and we gave combination drugs, uh, low-dose FK and MD-700. In this case, we even reduced FK levels to 0.05 milligram per kg. So, as you can see, the control animals with single drugs all died in about 10 days, um, but animals treated with dual drugs survived longer, uh, but all animals died within three months. And we found the kidney allograft actually developed fibrosis uh, during that time. So we decided to repeat same seven days treatments at one month, two months, and three months after transplantation. As you can see, with animals with repeat treatment, uh, most of them, 92% survive for long term with normal kidney functions. So to determine whether these treated animals develop antigen-specific tolerance, we perform a skin transplantation. As you can see here, the third-party skins was rejected around seven days. But skin allograft from the same kidney donors survived longer, up to one month, but eventually rejected. So we think probably this treatment did not induce antigen-specific immune tolerance, but maybe antigen-specific immunosuppression. Again, the, we also measured uh, stem cell recruitment and mobilizations in this model, and also our regulatory T cells in the graft. As you can see again, the combination treatment not only increased the mobilization of stem cells, but also increased the recruitment of these stem cells into the kidney allograft. And interestingly, 
some some important cytokine expression actually decrease in combination drug treated animals in the kidney myelogram. So finally, the host three population again occurred in this kidney transplantation in animals in drug treated animals displaying long term acceptance. For example, you can see the um, the negative kidney transplant into a GLP positive recipients uh, by one month you see a uh, increased fluorescence um, by um, 120 days you see more increased fluorescence in the kidney graft and the tissue section confirmed their GLP positive tubular cells tubular uh, paratubular endothelial cells and we also perform the um, um, uh, in situ hybridization for Y chromosome in the sex mismatched kidney transplantation models. As you can tell, um, many kidney cells are host region, and including some um, uh, paratubular capillary endothelial cells and even Bowman's capsule cells. So, with these exciting findings, we decided to uh, extend our studies to uh, large animal models. And fortunately, with the funding uh, from uh, uh, Zanzam Incorporations, uh, we are able to do that studies in uh, large uh, pig models. Uh, the pig we used actually from uh, provided by Dr. David Sachs from uh, Mass General. So these pigs are HL, uh, SLA identified pigs, basically MHC identified pigs. So we perform uh, uh, SLA fully mismatched transplantations in this case. First, as you can see, the drug treatment again works in, in the pigs because you can see the drug can mobilize stem cells in pig also. And we basically repeat the same model from um, uh, we found from uh, rat transplantations. The control of either single drug treated pigs all died within two months after transplantation. Uh, animals with only short term seven days treatment after transplantation survived for eight months but eventually developed renal failure and we have to sacrifice him. Uh, but the history show that kidney developed fibrosis. We don't know why. Uh, maybe Dr. Sol Solis can help to figure out. Uh, but interestingly, these pigs with repeat treatment at one month, two months, and three months can survive for long term over three and a half years until we, our paper was accepted. So we have to sacrifice them because uh, uh, it's too expensive to pay the housing for pigs. $720 per month per pig at Hopkins. In this long-term survival pigs, we also try to determine if the animals develop antigen-specific tolerance uh, by using a mixed lymphocyte reaction with a donor and also with the third-party uh, lymphocytes. And also we perform the skin transplantation in these animals. As you can see here, the both donor skin and the third-party skins were rejected almost the same time, about two weeks after uh, transplantation. Um, so the other interesting thing is after skin re rejection, actually we found the creatinine levels in these pigs actually dramatically increased to 4.5, 4.7. So we thought, well, probably this is the end because after skin rejection, animal may develop a donor-specific antibody. And in this case, probably developed antibody mediated rejection in kidney allograms. So we did needle biopsies and Dr. Robson helped us to read the slides and she suggests probably there's a cellular rejections but no antibody mediated rejection. So we decided to give another seven days treatment. So we did and after another round treatment animal fully recovered and with normal kidney function up to like three and a half years. So interestingly, the follow-up study found that indeed these animals, although skin rejected, but did not develop donor-specific antibodies. So again, 
we use a semi-quantitative PCR to measure Y chromosome expressions in the sex mismatched uh, pig transplantations. And by using this method, um, basically we found about 40 to 60% of genomic DNAs was replaced by hosted DNA. Here I show you um, some biopsy studies, biopsy uh, samples we studied from these pigs. Um, on, your left hand, on your left hand, you can see the, these uh, a low dose FK, a long treated pigs, that pig survived actually uh, 57 days after transplantation. You can see almost one month, the pig, uh, the kidney already developed a chronic rejection. There are C4D depositions. Um, and, but no any regulatory T53, positive regulatory T cells in kidney biopsies. However, all biopsies from uh, these long-term survived uh, uh, pigs show a dramatically increased FOX T3 positive cells in kidney anagrams. And there's no NAC40 deposition in the kidney anagram, even after skin um, rejection. We published this red and uh, uh, pig studies in American Journal of Transplantations, and uh, you know, the journal put the uh, highlight our studies on the cover of AJT. Nature Review also wrote the uh, uh, research highlight on our findings, and they call our findings as uh, the phenomenon as uh, reverse commerism. Um, but I don't like this name. I want. I, I think more likely. Uh, our phenomenon is uh, allograft cameras, not reverse cameras. They call reverse cam cameras, actually, they think this is a conceptually reverse of mixed cameras, but I don't think this is a truly reverse uh, mixed cameras. This is basically uh, uh, allograft cameras. And also some um, Fox News also highlighted, highlighted our uh, findings. In summary, we have developed a, a safe new stem cell mobilizing strategy that enabled long-term liver allograft survival in a strongly rejecting red string combination. And long-term kidney and kidney allograft survival without sustained immunosuppression in small animals and large animals by using a combination of two FDA approved drugs. So how that works? So we think probably AMD 700 treatment increased ability uh, the, of the avail availability of host stem cells in the circulation, while low dose FK treatment enrich these mobilized stem cells and the regulatory T cells in the allograft. The recruited stem cells probably can promote regeneration and or repair of damaged uh, the allograft, while infiltrating regular T cells probably help to create a local tolerance or immunosuppressive environment. So that results in uh, allograft cameras and acceptance. So we think the tolerance can be induced by induction of allograft cameras. I will stop here. And finally, I would like to acknowledge my uh, all collaborators, um, especially Mel Williams and Dr. Bertie. And also, uh, we are establishing, establishing a, a new collaboration with uh, Dr. Solis. And hopefully in the next couple of years, we can figure out the, the exact mechanism and figure out the exact historical change about allograft cameras. And these um, people are currently working in my lab. Thank you. Great. So are there any questions from the Calgary Health Region? Okay, what about local Questions here. Yes. That was really interesting data. I'm just wondering 
uh, if you look at the indirect response to transplant. So you would expect if you augment the amount of recipient APCs in the graft, you would be promoting an indirect response to transplant and blunting the direct response. So would it be something, an approach that's generalizable to tissues that can be injected indirectly? Okay, so you talk about the uh, APC antigen presenting cells in the in the graft. Um, I I think here is um, so so I think our findings uh, is kind of different from the you know mainstream studies in the in the field. Um, so uh, we are not focusing on the antigen presenting cells or you know direct pathway or indirect pathway to trigger immunities, allo immunities. Um, so here, what we show here is, we think if you can mobilize more host stem cells and also mobilize um, more regulatory T cells from host size into the allograph, and that may not only promote host repopulation, but also may create a, a tolerance environment for the graft survival. So uh, this is uh, kind of different from uh, the traditional um, uh, um, uh, ILO immune um, tolerance. So are you saying that the amount of recipient APCs in the graft is the same? No, we, we did not measure the APCs, antigen present cells. And we focusing on the stem cells and regulatory T cells. Um, possible with this treatment, you may increase uh, antigen present cells from the host also in the graph. Yes, possible. Um, but we did not study that. That's one more. Uh, I'm not sure I might have missed it, but did you look at how much of the endothelial cells are uh, changed to host type? Oh, the, um, we did many studies. Now we are doing many other models also. We believe the endothelium is the, is the most easiest part can be repopulated by host. So actually that phenomenon also happened in humans with transplantation. Even you give a full dose in the patients, still in many patients you show a endothelium was repopulated by host. Uh, questions. Is the amount of repopulation of the So your first question is about uh, whether younger recipient yes. does better. Yes. Um, we did not do that study yet. We did not truly compare aged animals and the young animals. But we believe probably younger recipients may have better stem cells. And that may promote, you know, maybe more host repopulations can be occurred. Uh, in, in the young uh, recipients than the older. But that's an interesting question we need to study. And the second question, whether damaged organs may be, may can be republished better than other, right? Is that a question? So, so um, um, we, we did not study that also, but one thing we did, we published one paper, for example, we did uh, fatty liver transplantation models in rats. So if you transplant, um, transplant the fatty liver, whole fatty livers into a recipient, all animal died in about uh, 72 hours after transplantation due to uh, non-primary functions caused by uh, damage to hepatic endothelial cells. But we found if you transplant reduced size fatty liver, 50% reduced size fatty livers, and with stem cell mobilization, that animal can survive for long term. So, so in other words, I think to promote host repopulation, you do need to create a room, you know, for the host stem cells to come in and to grow 
to regenerate. If there's no room, like uh, um, currently we give all transplant patients full dose in most patients, we do our best to protect the donor graft from any injuries. So basically, the transplant graft, no need for regeneration. And that means there's no room for host repopulation. So that's what we saw. Yes, Al? So it's certainly provocative. Thank you. In the, in the liver um, allograft experiments, for example, what, what cell populations do you actually constitute? So, okay, uh, in that study, we found, like, majority Cooper cells were first repopulated, quickly repopulated, and then anocele cells were repopulated, and also we found, like, 50 to 80 percent hypothesized also repopulated by host uh, uh, genotype uh, cells. So follow-up question, I guess, do you think that these are, like, these different cell populations are all from, from the same stem cell? Probably not. We are currently trying to figure out uh, what kind of stem, stem cells in Bomber are major contributors for the uh, repopulation. And, but one thing I can share with you now here is we found uh, the predominant cell populations you know, may play a key role are CD133 positive stem cells in the bone marrow. And, but interestingly, for example, uh, endocytic progenitor cells express CD133, right? And some mesenchymal stem cells also express CD133. So we don't know exactly which lineage truly play a role in, you know, in the regeneration of different cells in the liver. We don't know yet. Other questions? Yes. Um, actually, not yet. Um, but we do believe the regulatory T cells uh, recruitment is the key for this phenomenon. And even some, um, uh, like for example, when we sacrifice these pigs, long term survival pigs, over three and a half years. And I did not show the data here, but the fox with three positive regulatory T cell, the number even higher than like uh, one years ago. So we don't understand why, but it happened. Yes. So kind of along the lines of making room for the allograft for repopulation, have you looked at CD models uh, to see if those orient or aesthetic criteria orient repopulate? Better or at least uh, better to control? No, we didn't yet. But we only know now is, uh, for example, in the liver, if you transplant uh, reduced size livers, and host repopulation must much faster than the whole liver transplant. Other questions? Okay, well, thanks very Thank much. You. And, Thank you very much. And, uh, Thank you. The uh, talk.